delighted to introduce a short presentation, uh, a version of which I gave at the launch of my new book, The Clarinet, at my wonderful publishers, Faber Music, uh, quite recently. What you just heard was the opening of a little fanfare I wrote for, especially for the occasion, and a few pictures of what was a lovely evening. So what follows now is just a, a short talk, very short talk, about a little bit about the background of this book and what's in it. Well, it all actually began when Leslie and Richard from Faber came round to see me one afternoon and we just discussed the idea of doing quite uh, a comprehensive book on playing the clarinet. The actual writing of it started maybe slightly unusually and interestingly it was this chap who was responsible uh, and when he told us all that you must stay at home I thought well I've got quite a lot of time now with uh, uh, all this time to spare let's use it profitably and write this book uh, and I think pretty much for the next three months or so I spent a lot of time maybe up to eight hours a day working on this and pretty much got this book together. A lot more work was required afterwards, but put the main shape of it together. And it was really quite an exciting time. And maybe one of the most interesting and helpful things was that loads of other people all over the world were also stuck inside and I was able to get in touch with them. And here you can see my list of thank yous and many, many people. I, I can't, unfortunately, I uh, won't thank everyone now individually, but if you're on that list, thank you enormously. Um, many people gave me so much help. Many scientific friends, because I've done a lot of work on, on the science of the instrument. Uh, some of it, I think, which has never really been done before in, in the way that we kind of thought it through. Uh, and many clarinet friends uh, have helped enormously. So thank you all very much. I do want to pick out one or two people though, if I may. Uh, and the first really is John Davis. John Davis was my teacher and an absolutely wonderful man. Uh, he, he taught me so much and so many other people. He taught so many people so much. Uh, he taught them not, not only to play the clarinet, but that, that life is all about sharing and generosity and, and wonderful um, qualities. Uh, the picture on the right is is John as a as a young man in, in his duo with Elsa Cross, who was a wonderful lady. She was in fact the last surviving pupil of Webern, I think, and and a great pianist. And on the left is John. Uh, more recently, he's died now, sadly, but more recently at at a Faber gathering. And also in that picture, uh, there's Richard, who is the CEO of Faber and a huge supporter. Um, so thanks to them enormously for making this happen. Um, just a little bit on the science, um, I got very interested in, in um, some very complicated papers on playing the clarinet by an Australian uh, acoustic clarinetist uh, who actually runs the department in the University of New South Wales, Joe Wolfe, uh, and I read some papers by him and eventually I actually sent him an email wondering whether or not he might get in touch and he did and, and we had some very interesting exchange of emails talking about all sorts of complicated things that I really didn't understand but do to some extent now and, and hopefully have included in an understandable way in the book. Sarah Upjohn was also terribly helpful. Um, Sarah is um, a physiotherapist who works at many musical institutions and helped a lot with, with all sorts of aspects related to the body, which of course, you know, the, the our side of the clarinet, which I talk about an awful lot. Uh, Ed Pillinger, um, who is one of the world's great mouthpiece makers, uh, helped an awful lot on all things to do with that the area of the clarinet. Uh, told me a wonderful thing actually um, in, in one of our conversations was that he'd set up this extraordinary experiment where he'd created a sort of a mechanical embouchure attached to a mouthpiece and the clarinet would work without any air actually moving down the instrument and of course that got a lot of interesting thoughts came out of that. Uh, two more really wonderful people this, I hope you'll recognise, is the great Carl Leister, one of my absolute heroes. And that's Carl sitting in my kitchen, in fact, uh, talking to me about the Debussy Rhapsody. Uh, one of the greatest players was in the Berlin Philharmonic for 34 years, I think, still going strong. Um, and, and he and I discussed many things uh, in terms of the more musical side of playing. And here is Philip Coupe, 
uh, one of the great French players. Uh, and he was very much responsible for a very particular part of this book, which I'll come back to later. Also, another one of my boyhood heroes was Stanley Drucker um, in the New York Phil for an amazing 61 years. Uh, and I, I wondered whether Stanley was still about. And I discovered not only was he about, I found his agent, wrote to his agent. And the next morning I got an email from the great Stanley Drucker. Um, and we had a, a number of wonderful conversations about all sorts of things, particularly about playing the clarinet in an orchestra for 61 years. Anyway, that was fascinating. So here's the book. Um, so many, many months later, uh, the book. And, and I just wanted to draw attention to the cover. Uh, and when Richard King, um, who's CEO of Faber, first saw this cover, um, he, I think, said, well, could, we, could we get that photo a little bit cleaner? Because he didn't actually know that it was a painting. Uh, and it's an amazing painting by my wonderful friend and clarinetist and pupil Georgina Lee. And it is amazing, isn't it? Uh, and it, it gives such a character, I think, to the book. So um, in this next little bit, I just want to show you what's in the book and just by giving you the, the, the title page for most of the chapters and a tiny bit of what goes on inside. Be prepared. Obviously, we start and um, and we are prepared and we talk about loads of aspects of uh, warming up um, both the body and the mind. And it goes into a lot of detail. And I had a lot of help here by various scientists of one sort or another um, to make sure that it's all absolutely there a big chapter on on making the sound um, and of course there's a lot about breathing um, and a lot about what the americans call voicing um, fascinating area of playing which we don't do that much of certainly here in the uk but there's a lot about the oral cavity and voicing and that whole area of clarinet playing uh, and then it goes on yet another chapter about developing tone uh, and talking about it in all sorts of interesting ways. And I just want to, to draw your attention to one little bit, um, which is this bit I call useful words. It's interesting when we talk about tone um, is the words we use. Uh, how can we talk about tone and find words that will actually allow people to think about the sound that they're making? So I came up with all these words, some of which we know and we use, but some which maybe we don't use so much, plus their opposites, their antonyms. Um, and I hope this gives us a kind of a vocabulary of, of tone, a vocabulary of words we can use to help ourselves and our pupils uh, uh, to think about the sound we create. Uh, intonation was a, a fascinating area to talk about um, and there's lots of interesting ideas here and again one particular bit um, I thought was interesting is the difference between just intonation and tempered intona intonation uh, and the difference really this shows the difference between tempered intonation how a piano might be tuned and just pure intonation and of course, most of this is impossible. Like, for example, you know, a true major second is four cents, four parts in a hundred sharper than a tempered major second. But a minor second is lower by 29, nearly 30 parts in a hundred. That is definitely audible. Uh, and some of the others, a minor seventh is actually sharper than a tempered minor seventh. Isn't that interesting? So, so to create really pure intonation, I thought it's quite interesting to know about this stuff. And there's lots of other interesting bits here. Uh, a major long chapter about articulation, which talks about different kinds of articulation, but also different kinds of accentuation um, and how that relates. And for example, I spent quite a time talking to Carl Leister about this. And just to give you one example, the accent mark uh, in the German tradition, it is not really adding uh, a dynamic emphasis, but more an expressive emphasis to a note. Um, and that kind of is, is very significant when we think about Brahms and, and, and other composers writing in the, in the Germanic tradition. Obviously, a long chapter um, and loads of exercises and ideas uh, about uh, fingering and, and finger work. And, and there's, a, there's a lot throughout the book. There's lots of examples from, from, from the uh, solo chamber and orchestral repertoire to explore in detail. Uh, there's a section on performance bringing the music to life, playing with style, 
etc. Um, and I've given some interesting thoughts here, um, things like uh, problems caused by food and drink that you might eat or drink before a performance, the effect they have, um, dry mouth, all sorts of interesting things there to discuss. And then um, a bit on the instrument itself where we talk about reeds and the mouthpiece and the instrument uh, and a lot about stuff that, that, that you know, I knew about but didn't know in a lot of detail like facing curves and, and how this really, how we can understand it in a way that is understandable um, and how it can affect our playing, a lot about that. And although this is called Further Information, it's actually got some of the most really interesting stuff near the back of the book. We have a, a history timeline. Um, and thanks very much to Michael Bryant, one of the great gurus of the clarinet today, if not the greatest, who helped me with this. Um, and um, that's really basically all we, we give on history. But one bit I'd like to just draw out. Uh, I wonder whether you knew this. 1969, the crew of Apollo 10 took the first music to play on the moon. And the first piece played on the moon, uh, quite understandably, was Stranger on the Shore, which, of course, the great Ackerbilk work. So the first instrument that the moon beings ever heard was the clarinet. Isn't that nice to know? Uh, and another um, area which I thought is, was really useful is that um, we've given durations of each movement of all the main clarinet works. I don't think anyone's ever done this before. Um, sat down with, with a number of recordings, record, um, made a, a note and then took an average. So it's, it's an average of the way most people play these pieces and I think very useful I think for um, uh, exams, auditions, concerts, recitals, whatever, to, to be able to look this up and find out the length of your piece. Uh, and one of my most favourite pages is this, Clarinet Dynasties. You know, who was your teacher's teacher and your teacher's teacher's teacher? Uh, and it's fascinating. Um, and you can find all sorts of wonderful links. Uh, and I'm sure there's a kind of clarinet DNA that's passed down from one teacher to another. I didn't quite know how that works. But uh, my teacher, obviously, as I said before, was John Davis. And, and you can see he doesn't go back very far, actually, because he goes back to Lazarus, who was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, British player of the 19th century. Only by three degrees of separation because both John and his teacher George Anson and Lazarus lived into their 80s and 90s. I also had some lessons when I was at the academy with a Georgina de Bray and through Georgina we can trace right back to the Lefebvre brothers, uh, Jean Xavier Lefebvre who wrote all those wonderful sonatas and back to Joseph Beer who is known as the father of French playing. Uh, and it's amazing. So there must be some kind of DNA passed from one to another that still must be there. And, and it was Philip Coupe who absolutely helped me enormously with that. Uh, one other thing at the launch of the uh, of the book was that we also launched the International Clarinet Community, uh, a Facebook site. Uh, and, and here are our objectives of the International Clarinet Community. Um, I'll just leave that there for a minute for you to look at. Uh, the idea basically is to raise awareness of the instrument and, and inspire more people to take it up. Because it is a wonderful instrument, the clarinet. It, it makes a wonderful sound. It's got wonderful music uh, in its repertoire. And it's a wonderful instrument to play. I, I love the actual sensation of playing the clarinet, the feeling you get when you're making the sound. And I want other people to enjoy it as well. So there it is, a little introduction to this, this book, this kind of compendium to clarinet playing, mostly about how to play the instrument, but with other bits and pieces as well, which I hope that you'll find, if you do get a copy, very helpful and useful. Thanks so much for listening.